Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Do you need a compass to find your character? Let's ask our guest, Bill Furlong. Bill, thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure, Bill. I'm delighted to be here with you. Now, Bill, you've written a book, The Character Compass, Transforming Leadership for the 21st Century. Uh, That's an interesting topic, especially today and as we talked about before the show. So I'm going to start off by asking you, how would you define character? So, um, first of all, Bill, thanks for having me in today. I'm absolutely delighted to be here on your show. Thank you. Especially because it's, it talks about success and we see character as fundamental to the, to the nature of success that people have, not just in terms of their work life, but also their personal life. And, and the character that you have actually spans your personal professional life. You have one character and it, 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 you, it follows you everywhere. So one of the big issues, uh, just to go to your question then is, is when the work first began back in 2010, it was uh, if the, the source of it really was around the global financial crisis. And, and some of my colleagues went out around the world and they said, what happened? How come things went so poorly? And they got a bunch of different answers. They got answers like, well, you know, the culture of the, org- of the banks were off or the compensation systems were misaligned or there was a problem with the risk culture or whatever the case may be. Um, but the one common answer they kept on getting back was is there was an absence of character. And so then they ask people, and this is all around the world, in the US and Canada and in Europe, in Asia. And the answer they got back, they, you know, they got 300 different answers back because everyone had a sort of a different view of what actually character meant, sort of a very subjective thing, kind of almost like an X factor. Some people have it and some people don't. And so the work that then they went away as, as academics is they said, okay, well, it's our job as academics to actually figure out what that actually means. And so they rooted it in, uh, they, they started really with what you would characterize, I guess, as the philosophical grace. So things like, uh, like Aristotle and the work that Aristotle had done millennia ago, uh, brought that up to date with some work that was done in psychology in 2004, 2005, Peterson and Seligman, fabulous researchers in the US uh, around the psychological definition of character. It's a VIA project, you can look at it online. And then they thought, okay, we need to take that. We've ported it from philosophy into psychology. Now we need to port that from psychology into leadership and organizations. And so they came up with a framework that really has these 11 different dimensions of character. In the center is judgment, because again, it's a business school. And so they're really focused on judgment and outcomes. And then you have these other 10 dimensions that, that surround it. And those things like you'd expect to see in an organiz- in, in, a, in a leadership or organizational sense. So things like um, drive and accountability and courage, but also quite frankly, Bill, the first time I looked at things I didn't expect to see. So things like humility and humanity and justice and temperance and patience. And they looked at that and they said, okay, these are all the different behaviors that we're expecting from the from the from the best leaders that we have and and so you have to carry you have to sort of take all of those dimensions into account and leadership is highly contextual so one day you might want a lot of courage and the next day you might actually need to to temper your courage down some days you might lead a lot of humanity some days well actually i think you always need a lot of humanity but i mean there's there's times when different situations call for different elements or different kinds of behaviors and you want to make sure that when you reach for that, that it's there. You have a, a reservoir that's deep enough where you can reach into that. And so that's the, the starting point is these 11 different types of habits and behaviors. That's the first key point. The second key point is, is that like Aristotle talked about, any virtue can become a vice, either in excess or deficiency. So think about courage, for example, too much courage is 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 foolhardiness or recklessness but not enough courage would be something like timidity and so you've got to be always sort of looking or assessing what's that golden mean which is what aristotle would have talked about that you want to exercise in the situation the last thing is is that they actually connect to each other they're always linked in terms of when you think about judgment 
And here's an example we can use is like courage and temperance. Think about a race car or even drive. Drive's another element of, of character. And so we, we often use the example of a race car. Imagine a race car with a fabulous engine and very poor brakes, right? So what's going to happen is you're going to crash on your first lap. And that's the same thing with character and leaders. And we see this a lot because many leaders have a surplus of, of drive and courage. What they're necessarily not so strong at is things like, like uh, temperance and and humility and so just like a car will crash in a ray track on around a racetrack going quickly someone who's got that sort of imbalance if you will amongst their character dimensions will cause their judgments to not be the best that they need to be so you want to have a deep reservoir in all of those different types of behavior and their behaviors by the way not personality but behaviors and then you want to have them all leading into a very contextual driven judgment and then you want to be able to, to sort of manage all of those uh, together in a way that makes the best judgments, which then also leads to, going all the way back to Aristotle again, best performance, but also the sense of human flourishing and well-being. And I think that's what we're really about. This is a human project at its heart. Bill, does the media today, does it cover up uh, bad examples of character? And I'm thinking, like, if you see somebody uh, pushing uh, the rules of a game, they'll say, oh, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. Or we owe it to our fans to give our maximum effort. And usually that means they just planted an elbow in somebody's head or pushed them out of the ring or did something that was either marginal or illegal. Um or, or, or just using the expression, they're pushing the envelope, meaning they're kind of going outside the bounds of what most people would accept. Do we kind of take a soft view of it because of that? You know, it's a, that's a great question, Bill. And I think the nature of the society that we live in, in, in Western societies in North America and in Europe and other places around the world, is that I think we, we don't appreciate just how important character is to our outcomes. And, and when I think about outcomes, I think about, you know, the medium to long term outcomes. Sure, maybe it makes sense in the very short term um, to, to maybe bend a rule or to do something when the referee's not looking. But that's not how, you know, organizations that thrive and survive in the long term actually operate. They're always looking to, to embrace the best kinds of performance, which is this long term sustainable performance. There's always... Um, I mean, I think our, our, our eyes and our brains are always attracted to these kinds of, of behaviors. It's, you know, you, you clicks and eyeballs kinds of things. But when it comes to organizations and it comes to well-being and it comes to the long-term sustainability of our organizations and society, these kinds of, of short-term behaviors ultimately are self-defeating. And... The thing with character, Bill, is that if you're not building it up, just like exercising in the gym, you know, or, or, or doing your whatever it is that you do to stay fit, if you're not exercising these character muscles, they're atrophying. And if you're actively making bad decisions, you're undermining the strength of your own character. It will eventually catch up with you. And that's why we think it's so important. Having said that, your initial supposition is correct, is that the world we live in tends not to reward that because it's not as spectacular. It's not as, uh, you know, that the slow, steady accumulation of success, someone like a Warren Buffett, you know, it takes a long time before someone actually sees that kind of success. So you've got to stick with it. And, uh, no, and I, I think that's the way you put it. If you don't do it like any muscle, it's going to atrophy. We're going to start losing it. And thank goodness that you're around and your co-authors and working on books like this and actually bringing it up to people that it still matters. And when you brought back the recession, <coughs> again, what caused it? A, a lot of uh, business organizations who said, well, the other person is doing it. I have to do it to keep up. And they put the country in a disaster. And pretty much when we look at things, it's, I think, almost any major tragedy or, um, I'm going to say, screw up by our, our leaders, organizations, etc. Somebody was lacking in the character to do the right thing or followed somebody because they thought they were doing the wrong thing. I have to do that to keep up or please the shareholders. And uh, really, all it did was make more and more trouble. Bill, before we... If go, I could, I'm if sorry. I could maybe even quickly jump in on an example there. A classic example of that was the Volkswagen, Volkswagen emission scandal. 
of like around 2014, 2015, the engineers of, at Volkswagen are enormously competent, but instead of actually using their competence to actually produce a better engine with lower emissions, they actually use their competence to cheat the emissions tests. Extremely clever, right? But that's that's the idea behind character. Whenever you see, the, the, the more you actually see an expertise or a competence, you actually need strength of character to actually to harness and calibrate that so it actually gets used in the way which is a long-term sustainable positive as opposed to a short-term negative. And most derailments that we see, both individual leaders and also organizations, aren't issues of competence. They tend to be issues of character. Bill, before we go further, I'd like to let our audience know that if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Bill Furlong. He is the author of the book, The Character Compass. And Bill, we're going to ask you, is there a website where we can learn more? Yes, uh, there's a number of places. This work's been going on really since 2010. Um, the, the website that uh, my colleague and I, Mary, Dr. Mary Crossman, have started is called LeaderCharacterAssociates.com. A lot of the work here, the, the origin of the work is at a place called Ivy Business School, I-V-E-Y Business School, and that's up in Canada. And it's kind of like, for Canadians, it's almost like the Harvard of the North. It's very much sort of a case-driven uh, case driven uh, curriculum and faculty. I went there myself back in the 80s. Uh, and the work, because of because the work comes out of a school that's very case oriented, it's what they really strive to have is deep theory that's connected to deep practice. They want those things bridged. And then the deep practice informs the theory, which then further informs the practice in this sort of virtual cycle. So both of those places, uh, you know, if you go to leadercharacterassociates.com, we have all the connections to all the different places. We've got a short podcast, umpteen uh at tons of academic articles. By the way, one thing that's probably important for your audience to know, Bill, is that we didn't wake up and the professors didn't wake up one day and kind of think, ah, this is what we think that character is. This work is extremely strong from a uh, from an academic perspective. It's been written up and peer reviewed in all the world's best journals. The the, the it's won awards uh, from that perspective. Um, it's really very solid work, and you can rely on it in in the sense of you feel like you're on solid ground when you're pushing off this work. I would love to be hope that this is a bestseller and on the bestseller list, one of those books that you see three, four years on the number one spot. Because I think if there's something we need in the world today, it definitely is character that we at least start paying a little more attention to it. Uh, because unfortunately, it seems so weak in so many places today. You mentioned the three C's of character. And can you tell us briefly what they are and how we can use that as a guideline? Thanks, Bill. And actually, it's, uh, I'll maybe just adjust it a little bit. It's, it was a framework that the folks at Ivy came out when they were first thinking about character, and, and they framed it as the three C's of leadership more broadly. And they, and they looked at those three C's, and the three C's are character, competence, and commitment. The one that gets most of the attention when it comes to leadership is really around competencies. That's what we go to business school for. You know, you go to, you take these leadership courses. It's really about the strategic competencies, the business competencies, the people competencies associated with leadership. That's well known and pretty well covered. The, the, the other part is, is around the, the idea of commitment. Like if you want to be a leader, there's a certain degree of engagement that you need to have. Like we, none of us want to follow a leader that's, that's not engaged, that's not committed to the work that we have. So there's this commitment associated with leader. The idea of being aspirational, wanting to be the best that you possibly can at something and, and bringing your organization along. That's actually fairly well documented. Most leaders, particularly the ones like drive is typically not an issue with people that are engaged in leadership. The part that they really began to focus on was this character piece. And again, going all the way back to the start of the conversation, you know, Bill, the idea that 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 character is kind of like this X factor. Some people have it and some people don't. I think the real value of the work that's been done here is actually it takes away the mystery of what actually character is. And it says, this is how you define it. It can be assessed and there's tools that assess it. And what's really important, you can develop it because there are habits of behavior. So you are not doomed to not, if you want to be a leader, there are behaviors that you can learn. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert, if you're an extrovert, whatever the case may be, there's ways that you can develop your character. 
and it crosses all, it spans all aspects of your life. It will make you a better performer. It improves your relationships away from work. It makes you a better kids soccer, soccer coach, makes you a better volunteer at your local organization. It's just enriching across all aspects of your life. And I think that's why I'm so, you know, engaged with it and 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 like it so much it really is a very positive positive uh, 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 force now I saw a term in your book and I always look for new terms for our audience <coughs> and for me so I sound smart and you use the term character contagion what is that thank you so much for that bill that's a great question uh, so the idea of character contagion is that um, is the idea that character, be it good or be it bad, has almost like this contagious effect on people. So there's a couple of places I could go with this. One example, of course, uh, you may or may not have heard of the Stanford prison experiment that was run, I think, back in the 60s or 70s, where they got a, a number of undergrads, I think, from Stanford. They made half of them guards and they made half of them uh, inmates. And they had to shut the experiment down after four or five days because the abuse of the inmate was too much. And so what happens is, is you get these sort of imbalances in power, you start to get a culture that starts to arise, and the, the negative culture that can take hold is actually quite remarkable. And so you see that in cultures and organizations, you can see it in, in, in groups and societies and teams. Another example was, is uh, my colleague, Dr. Mary Crossan had done some work with the Carolina Hurricanes, which is an, a National Hockey League ice hockey team. And they talked about, um, and what Mary does, Mary works with them at the NHL Combine, where they actually interview these kids coming in, and they, and they just they do more than how fast can you skate, how hard can you shoot, how big are you, how much can you lift. But Mary's trying to get at what kind of person is this 18-year-old kid that we're actually thinking about drafting? Because it's so important as to who the person is with the long-term value of that person to the, to the team. And one of the comments that the captain of the Hurricanes had said, because they had won the Stanley Cup, uh, I think, in the previously, and they had said the, the, the nature of the clubhouse at that time was, is we could have actually brought a criminal into that room and we would have reformed them and they would have become a great team player just because the culture was so strong. And so that's the idea of contagion. And contagion can work for you. It can work against you. Arguably in organizations that, that, uh, uh, that start to uh, derail, you start to see something go poorly and, and that can, it, there's this almost contagion. But there's also, if you can be someone who has a great deal of strength of character, you actually can become this sort of, um, you become, even if you have no one reporting to you, Bill, you can still be a person that people look to in that example. And you can all think of examples of people in their lives who we've thought about, oh yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about that person and they really have inspired me to be a better person to maybe stand up when it's hard to stand up, to say something when it's tough to say something, to hang in there when it's tough to hang in there. But if you can actually create a framework inside of organizations where people don't have to guess at what the habits of character are, but actually can actively, intelligently, and intentionally practice them, you start to create this, this critical mass, if you will, of character that starts to become contagious in the organization. And people just look at it, and, and it, it then leads, of course, into culture, Bill, which is another place we can actually go. But it's, it leads into this culture of character that just that becomes this outstanding place where you can bring your whole self to work, be very proud of it as what you do every single day, have a sense of strength of performance, but also a strength of, self, of, of well-being. I think that's so well put because, again, what do we do if we see a coach and if they give us certain rules and we see them following it, we're going to follow them or a teacher or anybody in a position of authority. And I'm sure also vice versa. If we see it, what did someone say? If the driving teacher tells you put the seatbelt on, but he or she doesn't, you're probably not going to do it. If they tell you don't smoke, but they're in the back smoking, you're going to follow their uh, directions. Exactly. Uh, Bill, once again, before we go any further, I'd like our audience to know that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is Bill Furlong. He's the author of the book, The Character Compass. And Bill, we're going to ask you again, could you tell us the website where we can find out more information? Delighted to, Bill. It's leadercharacterassociates.com. And within that website, there's all kinds of information about Mary and myself and the work that we do, but tons of different links to the work at Ivy Business School, at a podcast, at a number of different articles. Um, there's just so much information that's been building up with this work. 
And I think for all of us, if you're tired of what you're seeing in the world today, it has to start with each individual. Uh, The book is great, The Character Compass. If you want yourself to change a little bit, or perhaps your children, or a better world, let's start it with ourselves. That's the best place to start. That's the only place we can start. Get hold of this book and uh, just see what you could fit into your life, how it would change something, and what you could be doing or might be doing to help your children and other people around you. Bill, are there any myths that we all are guided by that uh, may be influencing us, us either in a positive or negative direction? There's a couple that, Bill, thank you for the question. There's a couple. First of all is, is that people tend to think about character as primarily as morals and ethics. And, it, and the work around character includes that, but it's broader than that. As I've mentioned before, it's around performance and well-being. Um, and so it's important to sort of to sort of consider that from this sort of holistic perspective. The second thing is, is that a lot of people kind of go, oh, my character is, I remember when I was growing up, the, you know, the saying was, show me the boy at seven, I'll show you the man at 20. And you do not have to be doomed to that. Um, character is, a, is, a, is like anything else, just like we talked about a moment ago, is, is, is exercise. Uh, as Aristotle had said, if you want to be virtuous, virtuous, act virtuously. If you want to have character, you know, act with character. If you want to have courage, you're going to have to act with courage. You can't think about this. It's almost like, it's almost like saying you can't get fit watching someone else work out at the gym, right? <laughs> it's, it, you have to do it yourself. And so that's the, it can be defined, it can be assessed, it can be developed. There are habits of behavior that we're, we're focusing on. I think the third thing would be is that um, a lot of the times people, and you referred to this just a moment ago, Bill, a lot of times people think about character, they kind of go, yeah, I know some people that could really use some of that character stuff. As you said before, the place to start is with yourself. And yes, most of the time, your character is 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 good enough. It's like it's like when you're um, when you're at sea level, you know, you're, you're you don't really think about your breathing. But now try and mountain climb, or now try and scuba dive. It's in those moments when you're under stress. Will your character hold up or not? Will you be the person that will? that will perform in the, day that, that in the way that you want to when you really need to? And the answer to that is, is if you've built up the habits of character, you will. But if you haven't, you won't. And so that's what this is really all about. And, and the idea of creating sort of this, and it doesn't take much. We're talking about it. Once you sort of got a base understanding of the work, simple choices, simple things to think about each day is actually can make a transformative impact in terms of the decisions that you make and the relationships that you have. One of the things we talk about is temperance, which is the idea of calm and, and patience. And how often when something hits us, be it someone cuts us off in traffic or someone says something in a meeting or says something to you, and you instantly react. If you have built up the, the dimension of temperance or patience, you'll let that one or two seconds just kick in and you'll kind of go, oh, okay, maybe that person that cut me off is having a bad day. Maybe they're rushing to the hospital because they've got an issue. Like, who knows? And so just that one or two seconds of temperance, just a bit of patience, can actually have a transformative effect in terms of how you behave. The exact same thing goes, of course, when you're engaged in, in, in your work or you're engaged in any of, your, uh, any of your personal life as well. So all of that's to say is, is that the, the sense of looking at yourself, starting with yourself, as you just had said, Bill, it's not that hard. Once you start to think about it, and once you understand the framework, you actually put on a pair of lenses, if you will, and you start to see the world and yourself in a different way. Bill, if I came to you on a professional, like I would come to a doctor, <coughs> and uh, I say, you know, I have really read your book. I want to get better in terms of a character. And you said, okay, let's start out with a test, like the doctor has a blood test, etc. cetera. Um, would you give me a formal test and a score, Would you talk to me for anywhere from 30 seconds to maybe an hour and say, that's how you assess my character, the way the um, athletes and pro teams do at a uh, football tryout camp or a baseball tryout camp? Or is there like one or two key questions that you'd ask me? Or would you go out of the room to see if I uh, stole a few pencils or paper clips while you were out? I would never check on you, Phil, like that. (laughs) You you strike me as a very trustworthy person. So... uh, there's, there are actually, one, it's a great question, by the way. And so, yes, there's a number of different ways. There's a, there's a, a, 
assessments that can be done and have been developed. And these are valid, repeatable, reliable tests. And there's two places. And again, you can find those through the website. Uh, one is through Sigma Assessment Systems. It's about 65 different questions where you rank yourself on a scale of one to five in terms of likelihood of a, of a particular behavior. Uh, and you receive immediately a response back from that. Uh, and again, that's something you can find through the, through the website. Um, it's the, the, the work at Sigma, they do, they're a, a North American based company. There's offices in the U S and Canada. Uh, and the work is excellent. And thousands of those tests have been administered. Uh, it comes back with a report. It gives you a sense of what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And oftentimes the issue is it's partly, a, you know, a sense of a relative weakness, but oftentimes it's the couplets that get you into trouble. So maybe maybe uh, weak temperance is not so bad on its own, but it's really bad when you sort of couple it up with a ton of drive and courage, because now you're going to sort of lead yourself into something. So there's that. There's also an app that's been developed by uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Mary Crossan, and her daughter, actually, Dr. Corey Crossan, called Virtuosity. And that's also a link. And that's something you can just do on an app on your phone. It's like having a, a character coach in your pocket. <laughs> and these are, again, that's relatively new. We're still sort of working on that inside of organizations, but we hope to have that soon be available uh, for, for individuals as well. You can also go through in depth. So for example, if you were looking to hire a CEO, then you probably want to sit down and have a one hour interview or a high stakes like Mary does with these NHL prospects. When it's a high stakes thing, you want to maybe do a one on one, have a real good in depth sense of what that person is by asking by asking like a character based interview. And we've done a whole bunch of work on that as well. And people find those interviews extremely revealing in terms of who they are. <laughs> Now you got me a little scared about taking one of those interviews. I might reveal a little bit too much, but I think you're really on point. I love that term. You gave me another one, so I'll really sound smart to my neighbors. The character coach, I'll be sure to tell them that I was speaking with a character coach and let them look at me, and then they have to ask me, what is that? Who is this person? How come you meet all these smart people? Bill, thank you so much for being with us and putting us on the right track, definitely. I'd like our audience to be reminded that our guest has been Bill Furlong. His name is spelled F-U-R-L-O-N-G. The book is The Character Compass. And can, once again, you give us that website? Uh, LeaderCharacterAssociates.com. And Bill, this has been an absolute pleasure. I've really enjoyed meeting you and our conversation. It's been just a ton of fun. Well, thanks so much. And afterward, I'll ask you for my rating after the show, but I don't want the audience to know it. So I'll see if I passed or failed on the character tests. You Bill, do, Bill. I can tell you already. <laughs> I'd like our audience to know that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success. <laughs>